Thank you, everyone, from wherever you are around the world who's joining us here today for this conversation on Twitter Spaces. It's part of our breaking news series here at the Redline Podcast. My name is Francis Leach. I'll be your host. And today we are discussing Afghanistan, Al-Qaeda and what's next. It's almost a year to the day, just a few days short of uh, the 15th of August when uh, the United States formally and totally withdrew from Afghanistan and the Taliban returned to power. And a lot has happened at that time. We're going to discuss that with a panel of experts who can walk us through some of the more recent events, including the death of Ayman al-Zwahiri, uh, the man who was credited with being the mastermind of the September 11 attacks across the United States, al-Qaeda. And, of course, that event is 21 years ago next month. So a lot of symmetry to this particular conversation this evening. Those who are joining us to discuss it with us, Lucas Weber, he's the co-founder and editor of Militant Wire, a news and analysis on military activity around the globe is where you'll find it, militantwire.com. Ayush Verma is a researcher and analyst with London Politica, uh, providing political risk analysis, uh, communications uh, advice and networks. Londonpolitica.com is where you will be able to get hold of him. And Laith al Khoury is with us as well. He's an intelligence advisor and founder of Intellinix, and that's an organisation that provides intelligence advice and distribution, a company based in the UAE, and Leith is with us as well. Thank you all for joining us. Um, I'll start with you, uh, Ayush, and get your sense of this. So Afghanistan, a year on from the withdrawal of US forces and Western forces and the capitulation to the Taliban, what are the evident characteristics of the Taliban rule 2.0 in Afghanistan after a year? Is it the same as it was before? <clears throat> Hello, uh, first of all, thank you. Thank you so much, Francis, for organizing this and Red Host as well as uh, Militant Fire, uh, you know, for having me. And, uh, you know, I am, uh, I'm honored to be in such uh, esteemed company as uh, Leith and uh, Lucas. So, uh, yes, I would, uh, I mean, you know, about uh, the question, I'd like to start by saying that uh, the concept or the idea of the Taliban 2.0 is largely uh, idealistic. And, uh, you know, if you, if you, if you look at uh, the, the geopolitical or the, uh, the, the sort of regional aspirations that the group has, I mean, you know, when I say the group, I mean the Taliban have, the Taliban have uh, apart from that, uh, you know, a lot of its uh, workings and a lot of its operations, uh, I mean, you know, resemble that of, uh, uh, you know, uh, that of a uh, barbaric, barbaric organization that we know of, right, from the early 90s. And if you look at the interior minister of uh, Afghanistan, it is uh, uh, Sirajuddin Haqqani, who is, uh, you know, infamous uh, in lead uh, associated with or now presides over uh, the Haqqani network. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, quite uh, ironical that, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the individual is uh, responsible for uh, carrying out or, uh, you know, overseeing uh, geopolitical relations and guaranteeing uh, the security of its people, uh, as well as, uh, I mean, you know, the uh, the foreigners who are there right now in Afghanistan. And uh, so, I mean, uh, you know, that's how, uh, that's how uh, I look at it, because, uh, you know, for example, uh, uh, women still are, uh, you know, they, they don't have access to education there, I mean, uh, in Afghanistan, largely, and the schools were shut some six, uh, I, I think, close to six to seven months ago, and they, I mean, for women there, and for girls, uh, but, you know, we were still, we are yet to see, uh, you know, uh, any any sort of uh, development on that front, and uh, uh, so that's uh, that's sort of my uh, you know uh, take about uh, the entire you know the idea about uh, Taliban 2.0. Lucas, has the Taliban's return shaped the strategic environment in the region dramatically differently than it was during the twenty years of conflict that went on after the US invaded in October of two thousand and one? What's the big strategic shift? since the withdrawal of European and US forces? Um, I think on one hand, um, it gives um, Al-Qaeda a chance to, um, to breathe a bit. It um, provides them some oxygen to regroup, rebuild, um, set up training camps, things like this. And on the other hand, there's also um, a lack. I think if you look at the Islamic State, there's, uh, the group has benefited from a lack of external counterterrorism pressure. 
And so they're kind of taking advantage of, um, of uh, this extra room plus the Taliban's limited capacity to provide security and stability. And um, I just don't see this getting better anytime soon because um, the Taliban, even though they've launched some fairly aggressive counterterrorism operations against ISKP recently, we just saw three, uh, three bombings on three consecutive days in Kabul, Afghanistan's capital. So these are some things to look at, I think. So in, in a way, there is a new dynamic here, which is the IS element, which uh, is now at play within Afghanistan's own borders and its ability to deal with that threat is destabilising the country. I might just ask uh, Lucas and Ayush and, and Leith, when you're not uh, speaking, maybe just to mute yourself as well so that uh, it just helps with the clarity of uh, the boys coming through elsewhere. Leith, just on that particular issue, what is the dynamic for those of us who don't understand between uh, the uh, return of al-Qaeda into, into Afghanistan, as we saw with Ayman al-Zwahiri uh, and his assassination, and IS. And what, where is that balance at at the moment? What do we understand about where that sits? So, Yes, uh, thank you, Francis, again, for, for having us on uh, on the Red Line podcast Twitter spaces today. It's an honour to be here. I just want to touch on one point before I underscore... Uh, a few uh, points related to your question. Um, you, you talked about the Taliban uh, 2.0, if you will. And um, I think I just it, it's, it's important to look at some statistics related to the Taliban today as a governing body uh, in Afghanistan, their return, if you will. And some stats, if we take the Legatum Institute, they rank it at 162 um, out of uh, in the world. Uh, so they lack in safety and security. They lack in personal freedom. They lack in governance uh, uh, aspect. They lack in investment environment. They lack in a range of economic uh, uh, quality aspects. And this is before the U.S. Um, withdrew from Afghanistan. I mean, similarly, if you look at the, the 2021 governance efficiency ranking, it ranks Afghanistan 145 out of 180. Uh, and that is, again, before the withdrawal of the U.S and European uh, uh, coalition forces. So just that, with the Taliban taking over after it's already, after the Afghanistan's already been uh, uh, suffering in global uh, governance index uh, and, and related indices, uh, I think we can, uh, we can assume pretty evidently that Afghanistan is turning into a worse situation than it was before. Uh, now it's ruled again by a, a global terrorist uh, uh, network, I would call, uh, uh, I know a lot of people look at the Taliban as this like localized, ideologically driven non-terrorist group, but I look at it as quite a terrorist group that has wreaked havoc on its own citizens uh, for a very long time. But two, um, we look at the rising threat of uh, ISIS-K, uh, especially in the east of the country, and we look at the potential for Al-Qaeda to revive after it's been quite fragmented and decimated uh, in large parts of the country in Afghanistan. I think uh, Al-Qaeda probably has less than a thousand fighters uh, today in Afghanistan, and most of them are quite silent, um, if not completely non-operational. And so it, with the Taliban taking over, it doesn't uh, necessarily equal a complete revival of Al-Qaeda, but it does give chances for some of the Al-Qaeda veterans that have operated there to either get out of the country to a more, uh, quote-unquote, hot jihadi zone, uh, or uh, potentially try to form smaller cells that could potentially uh, uh, wreak havoc on uh, s certain strategic areas uh, in Afghanistan related to either foreign investment, related to uh, potential um, uh, international NGO offices, and so on. That is just to get back in the spotlight. Does it seem that the uh, international fight between the uh, IS elements and al-Qaeda actually suits the West in a sense, that that internal battle within Afghanistan at least means that uh, that force is not being projected beyond its borders? Is that, is that a reasonable assessment, Lucas, or is that a bit naive? Um, <clears throat> I think that right now um, al-Qaeda in Afghanistan is under some... Uh, uh, pressure and I think strategically, um, at the moment they don't really want to uh, upset their hosts. But um, I, probably uh, the risk for 
uh, attacks on what they usually call the fire enemy or on the West or whatever is uh, you may see it come from um, their branches, uh, maybe like Al-Shabaab or uh, AQAP or something like this for, that gives uh, plausible deniability where uh, Al-Qaeda's leadership in um, Afghanistan doesn't necessarily have their fingerprints on it. And um, I think it, when you look at um, the Islamic State uh, in Afghanistan, it, it, they've actually internationalized uh, quite notably since um, the Taliban took over. So they've started producing propaganda in, 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 in a lot more languages. They have um, expanded their operational range into Central Asia by firing rockets at Uzbekistan, Tajikistan. Um, they've been really uh, pushing hard to appeal to uh, uh, more um, speakers of more languages and of more ethnicities in South and Central Asia. And they've started producing propaganda in English um, to give it a more global dynamic. So I think um, any notion of uh, the two for, uh, forces fighting each other were a uh, conflict in Afghanistan uh, m uh, necessarily meaning they'll be contained is, is, is flawed. Uh, I just, just on that issue, which way does the Taliban stick or twist? I mean, is it in their interest then to, to uh, once again be in league with Al-Qaeda in order to see off the Islamic State threat? And what are the implications for Afghanistan's international relations as, as uh, isolated as they are if they were to allow that to happen? And it seemed that with Ayman al-Zwahiri turning up in, in, uh, in Kabul the way that he did and living in relative comfort and safety amongst the, the, the uh, Afghan elite, the Taliban elite, that that alliance had been rejoined. Right. Uh, so firstly, I mean, you know, the point that uh, Lucas made about uh, uh, Al-Qaeda and ISIS not seeing, you know, eye to eye and, uh, you know, work towards or like, you know, collaborate in the future uh, so as to uh, sort of, you know, uh, I mean, you know, elongate their own uh, existence, right? I mean, you know, only yesterday, I think today, the CTC Sentinel, uh, you know, they published a report. It, it's written by Don Razzler and Muhammad al Ubaidi, And, you know, they, they sort of pose this very, like, you know, uh, plausible hypothesis that uh, uh, the two groups could come together. And, you know, uh, and, uh, you know, the, 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 because even they, even the, uh, even the IS, uh, even the IS uh, suffered, uh, you know, uh, a leader, uh, you know, the a leader, uh, an act of leadership decapitation on their end, right? And when uh, Hashemi was, uh, uh, you know, killed, and now, now Al Qaeda, uh, you know, is dealing with uh, the death of Al Zawahiri. Now, this is something that they have in common, and there is is what they, I mean, you know, is what they uh, sort of pose the this theory that you know there is a chance that. Uh, the two groups could, uh, you know, uh, sort of uh, come together and uh, uh, now, you know, deal with the uh, CT pressure from the US and uh, the West, right? But, uh, you know, there is, as far as the Taliban playing the balancing act with the, uh, you know, the international or transnational jihadi community, as well as uh, the, uh, I mean, you know, the regional players, you know, when you when you talk about geopolitically, right? So there is a saying in Pashto, I read it somewhere in one of the articles, which says that you can't hold two watermelons in one hand, right? In this case, the, uh, in this case, the watermelons are jihadi supporters of the Taliban on one side, the hardliners, right? And the international community on the other, right? Now, uh, the, the, the problem that... Uh, uh, you know, that, uh, I mean, see, the thing is that the long war against Al-Qaeda and its regional partners is far from over, right? But the death of uh, Al-Zawahiri marks uh, sort of the near end of a generational era for Al-Qaeda. And it also marks the closing of a chapter of U.S. counterterrorism activity. So the transition uh, and which sees the transition to a newish era of internationally sort of oriented American counterterrorism, uh, yeah, you know, tactics, uh, one that is less and less about 9-11 and, you know, and uh, more about capabilities of, uh, you know, m more about curtailing the external power projection capabilities of, uh, you know, key networks, ensuring regional stability and things like that. Right now, yeah. it. 
I mean, you know, when you talk about the U.S. Uh, says relationship vis-a-vis -vis Taliban, it also poses some uncomfortable questions for American official in terms of how to approach the Taliban. Now that it is obvious that the group deliberately broke the terms of Doha Agreement, which, if you ask me, is is written in a most in the most vague manner, which is like you know, could I mean you know things that are written there can be maneuvered by almost anyone, like you know a layman. You know, the, I mean, it says that uh, the 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 land of Afghanistan won't be used to launch attacks in the, the regional or in the you know in the west or the, in the regional countries, but it doesn't say anything about not harboring a fugitive or not harboring a uh, terrorist with a 25 million bounty on his head, uh, right? So, I mean, this sort of called for the Taliban to sever relationship with transnational terrorist groups. I mean, you know, I mean, the Doha agreement originally, and with particularly uh, Al-Qaeda. But many argue that, you know, that the United States need to engage with the Taliban to prevent a humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan. Yet, I mean, you know, if you look at the bad displays of faith on the part of Taliban, that's what makes it a Faustian bargain. You know, if you ask me, that could prove counterproductive in the long run. So that is why, like, you know, and and uh, additionally, like, you know, with Zawahiri's killing, I mean, uh, you know, as the Taliban works to determine how the United States learned of Zawahiri's location, it could lead to accusations of spying, causing splinters to emerge. And, you know, there could be fissures within Taliban as well. And, you know, hardliners then looking at the ISKP as the next best opportunity or the next best place. Like, how does the United States navigate this now? Obviously, President Biden used the opportunity to claim a, a victory with Zaha El Zawahiri's uh, assassination. But at the same time, the alarming thing was, as you've all pointed out, that uh, the Taliban had uh, the most senior official from Al Qaeda in its midst. And the United States has spent 20 years fighting a war to try to prevent Afghanistan becoming the base for uh, international terrorism from al-Qaeda and other elements once again. But here we are, almost circling back to the same point as where we started. So so what does the United States do as the predominant uh, international power uh, to try to make sure that its interests are not going to be threatened by events in Afghanistan again? Yeah, sure. Uh, I think there are um, a number of... Uh, uh, facts here to, uh, to, to peel uh, around. So first things first, with the Doha agreement, I mean, the, the United States explicitly said that the Taliban should, quote, guarantee to prevent the use of Afghan soil by an international terrorist group or individual uh, against the security of the United States and its allies. And of course, the word allies uh, is, is a very uh, uh, wide uh, term that could be applied to essentially uh, any country. Uh, so th the United States, I think, intentionally uh, kept uh, this clause in the Doha Agreement pretty uh, wide and, and vague to be interpreted as to enable the United States in the future, if it sees fit, to intervene again uh, and potentially prevent the uh, enlargement uh, of a terrorist group that existed before or a new one, uh, that it would give it some room uh, to be able to intervene. But two, I mentioned in my uh, MSNBC interview recently that the United States had to deploy uh, its intelligence assets and resources um, uh, as it was withdrawing from Afghanistan in order to keep its fingers on the pulse. This is a critical need uh, for the United States national security, but also the security of its personnel and interests around the world to keep its fingers on the pulse. To, to um, you know, There is no trust element between the United States and the Taliban. Uh, I think this is widely accepted at this point that the uh, Taliban are not going to somehow jointly cooperate in intelligence matters uh, with the United States, uh, whether or in, in issues related to Al Qaeda or potentially issues related to uh, ISIS. I think they will work just completely disjointly. So the idea that uh, you know. Uh, uh, the Taliban did not, uh, in it, you know, allow the United States to know of the existence of Zawahiri while he was under their protection, or uh, maybe even down in the near future to let the United States know about other members, uh, other senior members of uh, Al Qaeda if they are if they are found or operatives or bomb makers, etc. Um, I don't think the Taliban will do that because, on the one hand, it might showcase that the Taliban has broken uh, the clause in the Doha Agreement, but two, it might also underscore the weakness of the Taliban, uh, and that certainly the Taliban is trying to show itself as a, as a capable governing body. Uh, so it will try to minimize um, any, uh, you know, 
any issue related to the existence of terrorist group there, even though everybody knows they're operating there. Well, we saw with the the the, the uh, negotiations around the the Iranian nuclear situation, the Iran deal, that the United States and Western powers could be pragmatic in their approach to a state which is considered to to be in sense a terrorist state, protecting um, its uh, power overseas through the use of terrorist uh, proxies elsewhere in the world. The Taliban were in Norway, uh, were invited to Norway for talks with members of civil society and diplomats in Oslo a little while back on the issue of international aid. Is there a Faustian bargain to be done here, Lucas, with Western powers providing economic aid and support for a, a form of civil infrastructure build with the Taliban if they could get to a point where they could believe that the Taliban would curb the influence of potential terrorist organisations uh, projecting their power beyond Afghanistan's borders? Um, well, <clears throat> I think the US and the West has um, kind of balancing act um, when they consider these issues. For instance, um, the Afghan people and Afghanistan as a country uh, faces deep economic troubles and a dire humanitarian crisis. So um, this must be considered but it must also be balanced with consideration of what could go wrong if, say, the U.S. unfreezes large sums um, of what the Taliban says is its assets. Um, what what could these who uh, what could these funds who, whose hands could they fall into essentially? And I think um, it's it's an obvious fact, but I think it's pretty astounding that Al Qaeda's leader was in Kabul, feeling comfortable uh, on a balcony. Uh, comfortable enough to stand out on a balcony. And recently you've seen, for instance, the Turkestan Islamic Party. They've started after about a year of not posting videos of their uh, leaderships or fighters in Afghanistan. They've uh, started posting videos again, showing them uh, overtly in Afghanistan. So they're getting comfortable and you're seeing these these players resurface. And um, I think it's important... uh, a lot of people think maybe uh, Al Qaeda's leadership in Afghanistan is isolated or they don't have much contact or control over its branches. But I think this is a misconception. Uh, most of what Al Qaeda does at, um, is at the local and regional level. And th- there is an international terrorist threat. I mean, uh, look at the Pensacola shooting, uh, the Charlie Hebdo uh, attack, or the uh, Shabab plot to. F- to, that was reportedly going to fly a plane into an, uh, a building in an American city. Um, and then you can look at Al-Qaeda's propaganda. They celebrate 9-11. They celebrate, uh, celebrate Osama bin Laden. They, um, uh, they still say that attacks against America are uh, a, a vital component to uh, bring down the, the declining superpower. So there's, there's hostility there. So... Um, it, I think the U S and the West has to be careful about, um, uh, trusting the Taliban, first of all, because they're, they're they claim they don't have any terrorist, uh, international terrorist organizations or leaders in their country when the, uh, the country is awash with them. So, uh, it's a very difficult, uh, balancing act basically. Uh, Alish, what about Afghanistan's immediate neighbors? Uh, Pakistan, of course, has had enormous influence in Afghanistan for, for decades, if not uh, centuries now. And it seems from this perspective that an, an, a destabilised uh, Afghanistan suits Pakistan and suits some of its neighbours. But is this a different situation and a different dynamic? And does the threat posed by the uh, re-emergence of al-Qaeda and the presence of IS change that equation? <clears throat> right. So uh, as far as uh, Pakistan is concerned. Now, Pakistan is dealing with, uh, you know, the, uh, it's uh, a peace agreement that's uh, ongoing with uh, the Tariqa Taliban, Pakistan, the TTP, uh, which is also called the Pakistan Taliban, right? Now, the Afghan Taliban, or, uh, I mean, you know, as we call it, the Taliban, they see the TTP, I mean, for the longest time, they saw the TTP as the militia arm, right? Now, the thing is that they have been deal. I mean, the two parties, uh, Pakistan and the, the TTP, they've been going at it in terms of peace agreement and figuring out the 
uh, you know, and finding the right way to uh, go forward. And uh, Pakistan's been relying on the Taliban now for the longest time to talk to TTP and uh, to and to oversee the smooth uh, sort of peace agreement and uh, the ceasefire. But uh, as we, as uh, you know, as we see, almost th- there is an attack almost every other day. And uh, you know, the 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 uh, one of the, the TTP topmost leaders, Omar. Uh, 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 Khorasani, he was uh, assassinated day before yesterday. And, uh, you know, uh, I mean, uh, and TTP, there are some factions of TTP that blame, uh, you know, Pakistan uh, for it. And, uh, you know, while the others, they're calling it, I mean, the, the researchers like me, we, we believe that, you know, it was it was one of the spoilers attack, which was like, you know, which could be an inside job of, of TTP. So all of these things, like, you know, among all of these things that are going now, Pakistan right now is facing, a, you know, a, an acute economic crisis, right? And uh, keeping that in mind, they have to, and the peace uh, and the ceasefire that, uh, you know, uh, the agreement that that's ongoing with TTP, they are, it, Pakistan is themselves, you know, balancing uh, you know all of these uh, sort of uh, scenarios now when you talk about uh, afghanistan's relationship vis-a-vis india now i think a couple of days before zawahiri was killed uh, you know uh, uh, sirajuddin haqqani he appeared in an interview on one of the news channels in india and he outrightly said that you know al qaeda has no presence in afghanistan and two days after i mean you know zawahiri gets killed right and so now and with uh, and India has stations, uh, India has recently, you know, reopened diplomatic relationships with, uh, uh, you know, are trying to open or reopen uh, uh, diplomatic relationship with uh, Afghanistan, but uh, uh, with the Taliban. But now, because uh, uh, you know, in the wake of what is happening, and uh, you know, the threat. Uh, uh, of the ISKP with the Islamic State, uh, you know, attacking a Gurudwara in, uh, you know, which is a Sikh temple in uh, uh, in in in, uh, in Kabul, right, in broad daylight, you know, all of these things now really, you know, it 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 uh, it would make even uh, India think whether to go ahead and uh, you know resume their diplomatic relationships with the Taliban. Lucas, when we look at the situation as it stands at the moment, and with the death of El Aswahiri, Ayman El uh just a week or so back, it seems like the end of a long cycle, generational cycle for the organisation itself. Is there a new leadership emerging in Al Qaeda that will carry uh, the, the philosophy forward? And it, could it also be, I guess, more militant to you know evolve into something? just as fr- frightening and, and threatening to the, r- the rest of the world? Or does the death of this generation of leadership within uh, the Al-Qaeda mean that the organisation is, is waning? Um, I think if you look at the, um, the current state of um, Al-Qaeda, I, th- I think people are too quick to, to write it off and they think, oh, Zawa, uh, he was boring and he would drone on endlessly in videos and things like this. But um, he actually, uh, uh, with the loss of Zawahiri, he, he had a deep pedigree and he was able to hold a um, international network together. And I think um, Al-Qaeda has a pool of leadership to draw upon. And uh, it should be kept in mind that just the general state of Al-Qaeda, um, I don't, I'm not, you know, from their view, I wouldn't be too bearish um, because they, they maintain a robust global network of militant affiliates across Asia and Africa. And um, Al-Qaeda's uh, central leadership, well, I guess their leadership um, structure, it's, it's fairly distributed um, across their various branches. And uh, they're quite durable. And I think, too, if you look at um, how Zawahir was able to maintain the loyalty of all the various branches. Um, there's, there's reasons for this. And, and uh, these branches and these actors, um, you know, they, ha- they have a loyalty to uh, the Al-Qaeda idea and brand. So um, I think you'll see this continue. And uh, you might even see um, some branches which have been degraded uh, uh, regroup and uh, strengthen. It, it's really hard to say. However, uh, uh, if I may, uh, uh, 
uh, just ahead, uh, if, yeah, I'd like to add to that if I may, and uh, you know because uh, he, uh, Lucas brought up a very pertinent point. So the general argument these days, you know, is that Al Qaeda now finds itself in a leadership crisis that might risk leaving the global Al Qaeda organization fragmented. I mean, you know, I see it slightly different. I mean, same goes for Lucas, I believe. And uh, yes, I mean, it's true that electing a new leader and the process for him to take, a, you know, on leadership, you know, across a scattered secretive organization that is always challenging, right? And especially for Al Qaeda, who only had two leaders uh, in its 34 years history. I mean, you know, the organization is simply not used to this, but uh, this actually quite this actually might i mean you know might be quite a good timing for the organization to find a new leader because al, al-, al- zawahiri's tenure from 2011 to 2022 was defined by several crisis situations you know the rise of ISIS, uh, the islamic state and the old egyptian uh, i mean you know the, the Zawahiri, i mean zawahiri himself proved a good profile for taking aq through such uh, challenging periods but now the situation is changing Right. I mean, it's, uh, the Al Qaeda is no longer facing the same CT pressure or the same challenge uh, from the Islamic State. The situation in uh, Afghanistan also offers new opportunities. So, so I believe that, you know, this provides a platform for uh, Al Qaeda to take advantage. And, uh, and I'm not quite sure that Zawahiri was fit for that. So I think this might be a blessing in disguise. I mean, you know, if I were to put it like that. The, the like, killing. like where at the moment is Al-Qaeda most active and able to actually project its force? Where is it found safe harbour at the moment? Or is it really now about almost franchising itself to affiliates like Al-Shabaab and, and other regional uh, Islamic uh, jihadist groups? Yeah, sure. So I think a couple of important points here, uh, uh, what my colleague just mentioned, um, I think while Zawahiri largely was dull and uh, not the, uh, did not exude the same charisma as uh, Osama bin Laden and really other uh, Al-Qaeda senior leaders, um, I think he did uh, uh, quite well in extending the footprint of Al-Qaeda to other regions while the group was going from highly centralized to quite decentralized, almost completely decentralized, uh, setting up the Al-Qaeda in the, in the Indian subcontinent, setting up the uh, Al-Qaeda in the Sahel uh, with merger of multiple uh, militant factions in Mali. I think that was uh, the quote unquote right thing uh, for a terrorist group that was uh, waning and really losing grounds in the AFPAC region to uh, gain areas of influence and find more operational territories in other areas. Um, uh, so I would say there are a couple of areas where Al-Qaeda is quite strong. Um, firstly, I would say Shabab al-Mujahideen in Somalia, um, uh, which has had a, a pretty uh, long-standing affiliation uh, with Al-Qaeda and at some point ruled 40 uh, percent or so uh, of Somalia, uh, I think it's still a, a very powerful uh, a faction uh, that's, uh, that could revive uh, even more so uh, down the line, depending on how the uh, Somali government and international security assistance uh, uh, does there. Uh, the other area, I would say the, the Sahel area, uh, specifically uh, in Mali and to a lesser degree in Burkina Faso, Al-Qaeda has found um, a huge uh, following there. Uh, and now with uh, the French military dissolving its operations there to a significant extent, uh, we could see uh, Al-Qaeda revive even more, especially again with uh, having this collaboration or, or this joint group, uh, Jamaat uh, Nusrat al-Islam al-Muslimin there, uh, that it could revive even significantly more. Uh, so to potentially take over uh, significant territory uh, in Mali. If we look at the other uh, places where Al-Qaeda has operated, as an example, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, uh, primarily in Yemen, at some point it was the group's strongest fact- uh, faction outside of um, the Afghanistan-Pakistan region. And today uh, we see it quite degraded to a, a significant degree and mostly occupying itself with um, uh, clashes with the with the Houthi movement there. Um, so we see a lot of 
uh, dynamics change, uh, whether it's territorially slash regionally or really internationally. One additional point I will say is that a lot of people look at Al-Qaeda's uh, uh, standing, if you will, uh, as it relates to their potential or actualized attacks against the West and Western interests. So if we look at the older days, quote unquote, we see Al-Qaeda killing uh, you know, hundreds and, and, and thousands of Westerners, multiple attacks, really big spectacles. And now they look at Al-Qaeda as this, this group that's been quite decimated uh, because it, it, they haven't uh, conducted attacks against the West and Western interests. Uh, the way I see it is that terrorist groups writ large uh, and Al-Qaeda here for our main purpose is uh, they are quite opportunistic. And uh, it, sometimes it's not reliant on a specific strategy for expansion, but relying on a specific gap uh, in security for opportunity to, uh, to strike and potentially expand. So I see uh, those areas around the world potentially wreaking havoc, uh, whether in the Sahel, uh, whether uh, in Somalia. I mean, some people will point to uh, Hurras al uh, in Syria uh, as another Al-Qaeda affiliate that's quite strong because they have some influence and some territorial control in small parts of Syria, especially in Idlib. Uh, but really, there, there are a lot of uh, localized dynamics there that uh, Al-Qaeda Central um, uh, has lost control over. Uh, so looking at uh, Al-Qaeda today, I would say it, it, it has the potential to wreak havoc. Uh, it, it has the potential to strike against the West and Western interests and recruit locally or in a grassroots way in places like the Sahel, in places like Somalia, like they have been doing uh, at least uh, since 2017, when uh, JNIM uh, got established, uh, and prior to that, when Al Qaeda in the Indian subcontinent in 2014 got established. Lucas, is it a case that uh, the United States and other Western interests, in some sense, are reluctant to become fully engaged in combating Al Qaeda uh, as long as those attacks don't? occur in the West. In fact, the, the, the populations would rather not know about it, and that in some sense, they're quite happy to, to think of Al-Qaeda uh, being contained or at least being engaged uh, offshore elsewhere and not really having to worry about it. Yeah, well, I think that um, the reaction to uh, uh, Sawahiri's killing is um, uh, pretty instructive. It barely stayed in the headlines and was quickly overshadowed by uh, Nancy Pelosi's trip to Taiwan. And what we're seeing now is a very large uh, structural shift in international politics and also um, a fundamental shift in U.S. foreign policy. Uh, and this is towards great power competition. So it's uh, U.S., Russia, U.S., China. These are um, the priority um, uh, security issues right now. and um, But at the same time, as I think the kind of war on terror era of U.S. foreign policy is over, um, it, it, it's naive to think that these groups aren't, uh, aren't uh, persistently hostile towards the U.S. Um, for instance, if you read uh, uh, Ramzi Yusuf's letter from the 1990s or Osama bin Laden's declaration of war in 1996, um, they state uh, U.S. relations with Israel, um, U.S. forces present in the land of the two holy mosques, um, U.S. intervention in, in Muslim lands, things like this. Um, these are still grievances they talk about. And um, they still talk about attacking the West and attacking the U.S. And they celebrate past attacks on the West and uh, those who can they celebrate those who conducted attacks in the West. So I think um, I think the hostility is there. It's just going to depend on these groups, what their strategic priority is, because as um, was mentioned before, most of uh, Al Qaeda's. Uh, resources and its planning is done uh, focused on the local and regional and then the the kind of international jihad element is um, it ties into this and it's intertwined with it um, 
but it, it kind of uh, uh, there's an ebb and flow. I mean, I, I think discounting it would be foolish. But of course, uh, great power competition is now at the forefront, and it will be for the foreseeable future. But the, but the terrorism problem is is not going to go away, or or the threat at least. Yeah, and just to finish, I guess the one thing that uh, that the twenty year arc of uh, the 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 assassination of Al Zawahiri taught us from uh, from September 11th to his assassination twenty one years later is these organisations endure and they are not on the timeline of Western politicians who face electoral electoral cycles and and political domestic pressures which inform their decisions. They are driven by a philosophy and a conviction which is patient and will wait for its opportunity. So this has got a long way to run if, if it ever is over at all. Yeah, well, uh, Al Qaeda has demonstrated a very impressive um, capacity for strategic patience and um, an ability to embed itself in uh, local conflicts um, and to adapt to local dynamics and even to um, enter negotiations with governments. So, the organization is very durable. Its network uh, is global, and um, I I see this persisting for quite some time into the future. Yeah, I mean, uh, I just like to add one point uh, that you know the 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 zigzagged in the West, if you could say so, is all about the great power competition, as uh, Lucas uh, you know mentioned, and uh, you know the U.S. is preoccupied with uh, aiding Ukraine, while I mean, you know, if you look at China the tensions are rising within assertive China over Taiwan, right? The fact that, I mean, you know, again, I mean, the fact that uh, the, uh, I mean, the fact that Nazi Pelosi's visit to Taiwan uh, received more, uh, you know, sort of traction than uh, the Zawahiri killing is, you know, it's quite, again, I mean, you know, it's, it exemplifies that very fact. But having said that, I mean, this again isn't a binary proposition, right? I mean, the, the United States can, and I mean, you know, must be able to compete with uh, the near peer competitors, I mean, you know, uh, and while at the same time, I mean, you know, at the same time pursuing a counterterrorism strategy that prevents, like, you know, the threats from metastasizing. Well, I just want to thank you all for participating tonight. It's been all this morning or this afternoon, wherever you are around the world in this conversation. <laughs> it is, uh, it's been fascinating and uh, we really appreciate it, Late. Lucas and Ayush, thank you very much for being part of our, our latest Twitter Spaces conversation on Afghanistan, Al-Qaeda and what comes next. Thanks for having us. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you for participating. And I should mention before we go, the latest edition of the Red Line podcast is out. Episode 75 dropped on Monday and it is a really important one. It's human trafficking in an industry lacking conviction. Uh, it's a podcast that's focused on a, a deep dive into human trafficking, which has become the third largest industry in the black market, but unlike guns or drugs, which uh, sees millions of convictions per year, human trafficking sees less than 0.5% of cases prosecuted. Michael Hilliard and the team have put together a fantastic deep look at this. Go to your favourite podcast platform and download the latest episode and subscribe. My name is Francis Leach. I'm head of breaking news at the Red Line Podcast. It's been great to speak with you tonight and, and or today or wherever you are, what time it is, and we will do it again very, very soon. Uh, stay uh, across what we do via our Twitter feed and our webpage, and we'll speak with you very soon. Bye-bye.